Mr. Sain, uh, taking your thoughts forward, you know, it's, it's important to learn with somebody like you. We talk call about the future as the innovation economy. Everybody t gives the slogan of innovation economy. It, so what are your thoughts when you look at the contributions of Indian special in places like Silicon Valley, in places like throughout the U.S., how innovation can happen in regions around the world, including India? W what is your take when people talk about innovation economy? Well, I don't think innovation economy is a factually good word because the uh, economy has many characteristics. Uh, the fact that it generates innovation would be a positive thing, that it generates uh, great human talent and skill would be another, uh, that it generates uh, a sense of equity and fairness and justice would be another, that it uh, generates uh, uh, warmth and fellow feeling and love for each other would be another. All these are important. By calling it innovation economy, that seems a little like a occupation of a space and <laughs> evicting others from that space. And I don't think we have to do that in order to recognize the importance of innovation. Because innovation is extremely important both for uh, economic production, as well as political change, as well as for social change, as well as for leading a good life. I mean, we want to find ways and means of leading a better life than we do. And uh, when we get advice on what to do about it, um, that's also innovation if it is new. So I think innovation is just a question of how you could have novel new ideas without stifling it. I think the three things that you need for it, one is not to have canonized beliefs against which you cannot go. And to the extent that sometimes religion does that, it could be have a negative effect. On the other hand, as Rabindranath Tagore did point out in the religion of man uh, in his lectures in Oxford, is that it need not have that feature. It, it could uh, encourage you to innovate also. Uh, but we we'll have to watch it because a lot of the closing of mind has come, actually come from, from uh, a religious beliefs of an extreme kind, of different religions, in fact. So there is that. So you need the, the non-stifling uh, belief systems, which is important. Then you need a sense of uh, equality in the sense that you have to appreciate ideas coming from any quarter, whether they're young or old, women or men, uh, um, and sometimes even children. I mean, sometimes children have an enormously good um, sense of the of the appropriate. I remember one occasion when I was shopping in the in a stationery shop, Staples, there was a little child, I think about five or six years old, who was being tagged along by dad who was buying reams and reams of stationery. And the child got very upset about it and said, Dad, what you said that is going to be only ten minutes, it's already half an hour now. To which the dad said, no, no, it's going to be uh, there will be just another ten minutes, and just to make the point further, he, the dad told the child, I love you very much. To which the child said, but dad, that is neither here nor there. <laughs> now, I think that is a nice innovative thought, that, <laughs> that the father can't get away by saying he loves it. He is behaving badly, <laughs> namely taking a child for a ten minute ride, and then giving the ten. So innovation has to be accept innovation has to be friendly to ideas coming from a child of five or uh, an elderly man of ninety five or young men going around or young women going around and full of faith. And the third thing that it requires a kind of cooperation with each other because innovations are rarely done alone. You have to go from one one thought to another thought, uh, which is why progress takes time. I mean, if you think about it, if we, the world in which we live today, uh, 
suppose when Homo sapiens have just been born, is we knew all the things that people knew when they were doing today's innovation. There is not clear at all why within a hundred years, uh, you know, from whenever it was, uh, 200,000 years ago, we couldn't be in a society like that. The reason why we can't is because it gradually happened. One thing happened, you invent a fire, then you invent a electricity, then you do things. So I think uh, cooperation is very important and making it speedy is important for that reason. Now all these are part of technological uh, education with a hum humane and humanist bend. And that's why it's quite important. Actually, one of the disturbing things, not just in, in England, uh, not just in India, where, of course, technic and all the brightest students now do science and technology, and very few, relatively speaking, tend to do humanity. It's the same thing. I was just looking at Harvard statistics uh, in the philosophy department, for example, graduate school. The, the number of people applying to do philosophy has dropped by 50%. And it's true in it's true of literature. It's true of most of the humanities. However, there is a kind of complementarity between humanist thinking and scientific thinking and technological progress. And all these have a role to play in in innovation. So long as we don't call it an innovation economy. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Singh, the other thing is uh, knowledge is accessible now because of technology throughout the world in more geographies, to more societies, to more levels of uh, uh, incomes. That is one kind of impetus. The second is, you know, you need the right kind of framework and the policy implementations in any economy. And that is, uh, you know, the factor that is not uh, well thought out, but not well implemented by governments. How do you think that the empowered generation can level with the government in terms of opening up more of these well, resources? I don't think you should set it up as a competition with the government. And to the extent that government is providing schooling, encouraging you, keeping law and order, uh, giving reward to the, and recognition to great achievement, the government is, is a positive factor to the extent that it's trying to stifle anything, either by censorship or by discouragement, then you have to oppose that. But I don't think you can say, take it up how to uh, uh, beat the government in its efforts to put us down. That's not the way to think about sure. it. Governments are our own creation. They are creation because there are many things we as individuals acting separately, atomistically, we cannot do. That's why we need the government. And therefore, I think the way to think about it is how different organizations, which on one end could be national government, then the state government, the district government, then there's NGOs, there are cooperative movements, there are political parties, there are media and uh, media devotees, journalists, uh, and there are groups of people organized in one way or another appreciating arts, appreciating theatre, music lovers who get together, they all interact in a certain way. So I don't think it's anything like A versus B, but it's a question of how the cooperation between people could be most encouraged, not even optimally organized, because that already makes it put as if that there is a captain running a, in an airplane, not like that, it's interacting with each other. So I think as long as we are looking for more cooperative channels in technology, in arts and sciences, in creative fields like painting and music and so on, in all of them it's easy to give examples of how cooperation helps. It's a question of how we can bring, uh, what we can do to help to bring this about. The success of uh, the global economy and uh, pertaining to the Indian economy is opening up in the uh, uh, early 90s. There are a lot more population that has come into a strata where there are accessible, a lot of luxury goods, a lot of better living standards. But there are a lot of other things that hasn't come to the younger generation in terms of, you know, equality, justice, etc. Do you think as an economist, look at the bigger picture, these are all growth pangs and it will phase out in the next decade or two as population gets more. Well, I'm not sure I quite accept that. I mean, just going by my students, they seem quite committed to think about these issues. 
uh, and everywhere is through here too. I used to expect it in the Oxfam, and I was always struck by the extent to which people from everywhere in the world are willing to take in enormous risks. Uh, you know, where the, I mean, we have lost, Oxfam had lost people uh, in Afghanistan, we have lost people uh, in Syria, we have lost people in Libya. Uh, people are ready to take risks. I wouldn't say that they are not. I think it's certainly true, and it became clear to me more in last July when my book in India came out. The business press was so hostile to it, as if giving any kind of questioning anything about the uh, the uh, inequalities in India to say why is it that one third of the uh, uh, people don't have electricity connection where we subsidize the power for the, for the two thirds we have. I also have a problem from that because the Indian hotels and restaurants are kept because power is so cheap, subsidized by the government at the level of temperature that I have to carry full over to a summer restaurant with it. And the first thing I have to do with arriving at an Indian hotel is to switch off the air conditioner. Otherwise, there's a mortal danger of catching pneumonia. But all this is a kind of result of subsidized power rather than extending connections to people who don't have the connection. Now, I think there's a lot to question, but I, to say, to blame the young for it, I think it's not right. I think it's the entrenched habit of thinking, not just of the young, but just this idea, and, and, and there's nothing that there's much harm today now, this idea that the government can't do anything, has to be able to care, with the exception of, I think, uh, these, um, uh, I've forgotten what uh, African country, and there's Haiti, and they, um, Sierra, Leone. Uh, uh, Sierra Leone, and there's one other country which is escaped me, could be Somalia, uh, where the ratio of government healthcare to total healthcare is still lower than India. But the rest of the world is on the other side of it. And for us to be told the government is overextended, it's just poppycock. But on the other hand, I read that again and again, and this is the kind of, this is the kind of apology for government bureaucracy, for which Professor Sen is well known. <laughs> and I don't think these are coming from the young, in fact. Finally, for economists who are so inspired by you, who are motivated by you, what is your advice for the emerging economists for the future? Where should they look at and focus on? Actually, I don't, I'm not in the business of giving advice really very much. I think people are thinking, they do think a lot about how uh, the economy could be improved. There is no general formula. Different countries need different things. If you take China, I was one of those in the, in, during the Cultural Revolution who have given lecture explaining why China has to recognize that the market economy is a great help for economic development. That lesson was not listened to at all. Uh, I didn't have any standing in China. Uh, on the other hand, I had lots of Chinese friends, I had Chinese students. But then in 79, when they reformed, I had to say that, look, you did very well in marketizing agriculture and privatizing much of industries and did it a lot better than the Soviet Union, that is starting private enterprise and let it win, rather than first abolishing the state enterprises, whereby the Soviet Union got rid of only institutions that did work in the Soviet Union, and they went through a catastrophic thing. Chinese did it very cleverly. But then one non-clever thing was they also thought the market economy would be the way to provide health insurance. So at one go, they moved from a Canada-type system to a US-type system, which in the Chinese context was a total disaster. It took them 25 years to change it. So I think people make mistakes, but there's also, after all, this was self-corrected eventually. Uh, I happened to chair the International Advisory Board of the Development Institute of Peking University. And in our discussions, these questions were coming up regularly from the students and from the faculty. But the government was slow. Only around 2000, 2002, they recognized 2004, 
they went absolutely determined. I could, for the first time, I even saw the health minister at that time, and uh, it was quite clear that there was a meeting of mine. And then, of course, within eight years, they've got the proportion covered to more than 80, now it's 96 percent. And I think, so that's the process to which people do. We make mistakes, we learn from it, we correct it, uh, and so forth. But I think to go on to take an advisory role saying, no, listen to me, I am thought to be a wise guy, listen to me, these are my advice. That's certainly not my style, actually. <laughs> and I don't think, since I turned 80 last month, at this stage I don't think I'm capable of reform. No. Thank you so much, truly Thank a pleasure, you. appreciate it Thank so much. You.